that if we don't solve, if we don't grapple with it successfully, that it will render uh, American democracy uh, as dysfunctional as it currently is, even more dysfunctional. And it will, in effect, create, uh, if it hasn't already done so, two fundamentally divergent societies where you have civil liabilities of uh, becoming, in effect, a kind of civil debt for tens of millions of Americans. And what we do about it as a democratic society and how that gets played out in our central cities is absolutely central uh, in, in creating a more vital and more democratic society in the country. And that's why the conversation tonight is so important. Now, we will have to keep um, One of the problems in having two different graders and a process of uh, undergrads and grads in the same class is that there, there have been more glitches in this class regarding passing out information than you, you, know, you can possibly imagine. So most of, from what I gather, most of you who were in the first cohort group who turned in your research papers in advance, with the exception of about two people have received some kind of feedback. Some of you in the second group have already received feedback. I know because I wrote a bunch of things today. <laughs> so everybody should get feedback within the next 24 hours. And the papers, the final papers are due with Friday. 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 Okay. Good. All right. um, it's been an interesting experience. I've encouraged some of you in the papers, research papers in progress, to really utilize the material we have online in the uh, Harlem website, uh, the Harlem dot uh, ccbh no Harlem dot dot Columbia.edu. Is that it for us? Good. Okay. Drag the stuff, you tag it just like John Frankfurt said, and incorporate that into your papers. There's a lot of material that is relevant to you that is very exciting and um, especially film and other clips. Please incorporate that stuff. That stuff is there for you. You know, people worked on this all summer to just to get stuff for you guys. So please utilize the material, the hundreds of assets that uh, we put together over the course of the better part, nearly a year, for you to utilize at this moment to enhance the quality of your research. Okay, so without further ado, I want to present Professor Jeffrey Fay, who is kind enough to brave the inclement weather outside and, uh, to grace our class. My pleasure. Uh, let me ask a preliminary question. Um, and I thank you all for coming out as well. Uh, how many of you guys and women know statistics? What level? It depends. So, so we could do this as uh, civilians or we could do this as serious. So anybody in grad school who's done knows causal inference? Anybody know cross lag models? Okay, we'll, we'll have a little side conversation at the end about that. I'll show you, we'll pull up the, the other PowerPoint from another talk and you'll see. Okay, well first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, uh, uh, during the summer, received an invitation from Manning and, and I was very pleased to accept it. Um, in part because we've been, I've been doing research about New York and about crime and law in New York for uh, 20 years or so and have been studying it during periods of time while things have been changing. And so it's given me a perspective. Uh, some of the studies include all of the neighborhoods in New York, including Harlem. Uh, at least one of the pieces that I did, one of the projects that I did, which was a big project, was about Harlem. And we contrasted Harlem with Washington Heights and with another neighborhood, um, which was about the drug economy that, that uh, Professor Marable um, discussed. Um, and lately, I've started, you know, during the, I, I have to, by, by full disclosure, um, 
The New York City Police Department really hates me. I'm really radioactive. And here's the reason why. In 1999, I received a call from uh, Elliot Spitzer's office, from the Civil Rights Division, and they asked me to uh, help them with an investigation of the NYPD's stop and frisk practice, practices. This was in um, May of 1999, one month after shooting of Amadou Diallo. Um, at which point, and even before Diallo was shot, there were multiple investigations about the NYPD's street tactics, stop and frisk, um, the street activities of the street crime unit, which was sort of the, the, the leading group that implemented this. Um, there were investigations by the Southern District of New York, the U.S. Attorney, uh, looking at the same issue. There were, so there were investigations by the Eastern District in, of New York, which is Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island, for the U.S. Attorney's Office there. Um, looking into pattern and practice, which is a slightly different legal, uh, legal claim, but nevertheless looking at the same issues. Um, and I had been thinking a lot about, like many other criminologists, trying to figure out why crime had been going down through the 1990s during this period of time. And of course the police department was making very strong claims that they were responsible alone for the crime decline. And I looked at data and worked with a couple of colleagues, and we, I'll show you in a, in a second, crime going basically up and down over periods of time. One of the facts that everybody conveniently forgot, and you'll see the data in a second, is that between 1981 and 1985, the crime rate actually went down at a steeper rate, by a greater percentage decline than it did in the 1990s. And nobody remembers this, and the policing tactics weren't particularly unique during that period of time. In fact, during that period of time, cops spent most of their time in police cars eating donuts and drinking coffee. Crime went down because there's a roller coaster phenomenon. Anyway. All of which is to say I've been studying this for a while and studying it while things have been changing on the ground. I was dissatisfied with most of the claims about why the crime rate had gone down. And so I started to think about other issues and the other issues be basically fall under a large residual category called political economy. Now, uh, Glenn Lurie refers to it in his paper that, I, that you guys read. Um, Glenn is an interesting character. Glenn is, was a conservative economist. Economics is a fairly conservative discipline. Glenn was a conservative among conservatives and was a very prominent scholar during many years in the 1990s, uh, kind of around the same time the ascension of conservative thinking um, and its, its dominance of American political discourse. Um, Glenn had some personal troubles and underwent a transformation and the result of his transformation is in this paper. Glenn talks about political economy and he weaves it into culture. Um, some of the, uh, we tried to do it and I'm just actually starting out down that road now, the, the, right, right now. So you'll get to actually hear a couple of new ideas that we're thinking about. Anyway, so let me step back and talk a little bit over time and bring you up to the present and try and finish this with two ideas that I've been thinking about and writing about, one of which you read, which is the Contagion paper. Um, and the other is um, uh, some ideas about political economy, about various aspects of the redistribution of wealth in New York City, and indeed even in New York State. You're actually going to see a slide that nobody's seen before. So anyway, let me start. Um, I don't know how many of the other people have spoken about crime at all. Beverly, did Beverly? Uh, yeah, oh, Beverly a did. Little bit? Yeah, she did. Um, and also Leith Mullins. Okay. So I'll, let, me, let me cruise through a little bit of this quickly. Um, you all know that crime rates in Harlem have, have always been higher than the rest of the city, higher even than many other poor neighborhoods in the city. That's probably true more in the past than it is now. Um, there's an interesting set of research findings both about New York and Chicago and many other places when you break cities down into neighborhoods that the poorest neighborhoods always stay the poorest neighborhoods even when they improve materially. So the poorest neighborhood in Chicago looks a lot better today than it did 20 years ago. It's still the poorest neighborhood in Chicago. The same is true about New York. The poorest neighborhoods in New York are still the poorest neighborhoods. They just look a lot better. There may have been one or two small changes. The South Bronx may have changed. It may have flipped spots. But for the most part, poor places always stay poor. They're always disadvantaged. There always is a measure of relative deprivation and inequality. Um, we know that this is true in New York, and we know it's been true over a period of time, and it's true today. And Harlem ranks among the poorest of the neighborhoods, even with the Renaissance and the transformation, and so it still suffers all the disadvantages of being in last place. 
Um, it's always had that burden ever since the 1940s, since the post-World War II era when New York started to change structurally. It was scarred, Harlem was scarred by the riots in the 1960s in ways that no other part of New York was scarred. And I think Harlem was scarred by the riots probably as much as the Bronx was scarred by the insurance burnings of the 1970s. Um, by the way, all of you, if this, is, you, this is a great fact for the ex-cocktail party. You all saw or heard about the book, The Bronx is Burning. You all know the origin of the title. The origin of the title was allegedly during the 1977 World Series, Howard Cosell, who was a famous broadcast, sports broadcaster, was sitting in the broadcast booth, and he's looking out over the wall of Yankee Stadium out to the Bronx, and you just see plumes of smoke going up. Now, as urban legend has it, Howard at that point intoned, he had a really deep stentorian voice, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. This went down in legend, title of the book, title of the movie. So I met the guy who produced the movie, and directed the movie. He never said it. Howard Cosell never said, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. He went through every piece of footage about every baseball game that Howard Cosell ever broadcast in the 1970s. Anyway, I digress. So New York suffered during the 1970s. Um, it suffered in ways that other neighborhoods did it. Um, it suffered in part from the fiscal crises that came from the transformation of cities. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read William Julius Wilson's work, but he shows very carefully and very critically about the deindustrialization of major American cities, New York prominent among them. And in fact, Professor uh, Sassen, who's here now, Saskia Sassen, who's now at Columbia again, um, has written about the same thing, the political economy, the transformation, the loss of millions of manufacturing jobs, the kinds of jobs that folks with low skills or unskilled labor, people who worked and lived in Harlem, often worked downtown, made a family sustaining wage, could support their families and send their kids to school. They may not have been rich, but everybody was pretty stable. That was wiped out by the disappearance of jobs. I live in a neighborhood where those jobs used to be. I live in Dumbo. And I'll tell you, there ain't no manufacturing jobs in Dumbo anymore. And there were 20 years ago when I moved into Dumbo. Plenty. And they're all transformed. They're all gone now. Um, I live in a building that I'm proud to say did not have, was a storage warehouse. It was not a place. I didn't take anybody's job with my house. Um, Harlem suffered through the drug epidemics. Harlem was, was, was one of the epicenters in New York of the heroin epidemic of the 1960s, 1970s. Um, I strongly recommend, I don't know if you talked about the Nikki Barnes documentary? Oh, no. Mr. Untouchable. Go see Mr. Untouchable. Forget American Gangster. It's uh, a little bit too mythologized. But Mr. Untouchable is a great movie uh, which talks about the life of Nikki Barnes and who Nikki Barnes was and what he meant in Harlem. And it says something about the power of the drug economy in Harlem during that period of the time that Nikki Barnes could ascend politically as well as economically as well as a crime boss in the way that he did and be so dominant in the neighborhood. Um, crime rates, homicide rates in New York tripled, as they did everywhere else, between 1968 and 1972, right around the time when the homicide, when the heroin epidemic began to peak. I don't know if they're causally related. I suspect that they are twin manifestations, <clears throat> twin manifestations of the same underlying phenomena, which is a, a, a corroding infrastructure, social and economic infrastructure. And it's probably a little bit too hard to disentangle, the reason I asked about statistics, because of the simultaneity that's involved, simultaneous causation. Um, but interestingly, again, in New York, as well as in the rest of the country, in 1972, incarceration rates started to take off. Now, what I don't have, because I had a horrible computer episode in the hour before I came here, was the slide with the incarceration rates. Um, but I can tell you that they took off in 1972. They crept up slowly. About 1975, uh, right around the same time when New York State began, when an, another youth crime epidemic had emerged, late 70s, early 80s, uh, they took off vertically. They continued to climb almost vertically through the 1980s, through that crime decline I mentioned before, through the 1990s during the crack and homicide epidemics in New York. And they didn't flatten out till 2000, a good six or seven years after the crime rates began to fall. And I'm going to show you at the end something very interesting about the transformation of what's happening with incarceration in New York. Uh, 
uh, and you'll get a picture, I think, of what, what, I, this, what this eventually comes to, and the relationship between crime and political economy and law. Um, let me show you a couple of pictures just to get you oriented to what I'm talking about. Whoops. You know, I just switched to a Mac. <laughs> and now you know why. Let's try it on the keyboard. There, come on. I am, but it's showing me something. I think I, it wound up putting the last slide first, so I, now I know where it is. Uh, this will give you a picture. I picked the story up in 1985, which was at the bottom of that curve. I'm going to show you a little bit other data in a second. And you get an idea about what was going on in New York. The brown line is larceny. This is what we call in criminology a secular trend. This has nothing to do with any other change. It's just going down. Um, murder rates went up peaked around 1991, 1990, Happy Land Fire was not in there, we count that as one event, um, and then made their very prominent and steady decline. They flattened out about 1999 and they stayed pretty much flat ever since then. Um, and you can see robbery and assault and these other crimes pretty much followed the same curve. Um, we had to multiply up murder in order to get it onto the same scale on the side there. But this is 2000, roughly 2,000 murders a year. Um, the murder rate, I'm sorry, the murder rate, this is per 100,000 population. These are all rates per 100,000. So you can get an idea about the crime rates. They were going, various crimes going up and down with the exception of property crimes. Motor vehicle theft followed the same, pretty much the same pattern. And there's another secular trend here in burglary. So all this is very interesting. If you actually sort of think hard about this chart, you see two different trends. Violent crime doing this property crime, by and large, with the exception of a little spike in motor vehicle theft, doing that. Long-term secular trend. Um, this is what happened to homicide rates. And this shows you, homicide rates are very heavily correlated, highly correlated, with all the other crime rates that you see, violent crime rates. Um, do we have a pointer? We don't have a zapper, huh? OK. But anyway, you can see. So starting in 1968, this is right around the time of the riots in New York City and also nationally, but this is New York. And this is also right in the midst of the heroin epidemic. And homicides are going up. Peak here, which is the tripling of the rate from here to here. Peak again in 1980. Peak again in 1991. Heroin epidemic, the emergence of street markets when, and cheap cocaine, crack, even cheaper cocaine. There is something very tightly spaced remarkably tightly spaced about drug epidemics and homicide. And places like Harlem, and maybe prominently Harlem, experience these worse off than most other places. There's a couple of things to think about with this. Um, let me show you another slide. Uh, one other thing to think about. We use something called trajectory modeling, mixture models. Latent mixture model Poisson regressions, for those of you who know the language, which basically takes those trajectories that you saw on the previous slide and sorts it by particular neighborhoods. We're working with a sample of 275 neighborhoods. These neighborhood boundaries were drawn by John Manbeck and Ken Jackson. Ken is a historian here. They've done this with each of the boroughs. Uh, they're bigger than census tracts. There's probably about five census tracts in each one of these neighborhoods. And you can see the different neighborhoods. So these are, here's, a, here's a group of 54 neighborhoods where things were very flat. This is the Upper East Side, not the Upper West Side, but you know, pretty wealthy neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods that had a slight bump. Chelsea, maybe. You can imagine the neighborhoods that had slight bumps. This neighborhood is, these are very interesting neighborhoods. These are what we call tipping point neighborhoods because they started a little bit higher. They went up and they crashed really hard. And these are the worst neighborhoods in the city. 36 of them, 13%. This is Harlem, Central Harlem, West Harlem, East Harlem, Tremont, East Tremont, University Heights, Bedford, I'm sorry, uh, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, East New York, Bushwick. You can, you can imagine which neighborhoods they are. This is an extraordinary decline, an extraordinary decline. So um, there's a lot else to think about. I mentioned the fact that, that Harlem often is worse off than other places, whether times are good or bad. 
Here's a really interesting perverse finding about this. We did a study in between 1987 and 1990, and we, it was a study of, of uh, uh, drug dealing on the streets. We interviewed about um, almost 1,000 drug dealers. We had an office on 125th Street in the state office building. We set up storefronts in a few different places on 125th Street. We had people come in. We used ethnographers to help us recruit the samples. We had people who were crack dealers, crack users, coke dealers who didn't do crack, coke dealers who did crack. We had every imaginable combination under the sun of drug user and drug dealer. And we also found people who were out of the game, just were, were clean, at least with respect to drugs. They drank, they did this, they did that, but not, weren't doing drugs. And one of the things, to make a long story short, a lot of the myths about crack we found out actually weren't true. It didn't cause instant addiction. It took just as long to get addicted to crack as it did to get to addicted to heroin, as it did to get addicted to powder, as it did to get addicted to anything else. Instant addiction was a myth. Instant violence was a myth. All these people who became violent were already violent. It just increased their violence. Uh, it didn't make people start selling drugs who weren't selling drugs before. Everything that drove what you all have heard about, with the crack cocaine disparity in the federal sentencing guidelines and in New York state law, was a myth. And there's no such thing as crack babies either. I don't know if Beverly touched about that. No. Wasn't true. And actually, the guy recanted on that. No such thing as crack babies. Anyway, but the one thing that's really perverse and shows why Harlem suffers as much, if not more, than other places, we compared the drug incomes of people in 125th Street with drug incomes of people. We had another field office up in Washington Heights and another field office in the University Heights in the Bronx. Make a long story short, which neighborhood do you think had the lowest wage drug dealers? It was Harlem. Harlem drug dealers made half of what the drug dealers made in Washington Heights, and about maybe not half, maybe about a quarter of, maybe about two thirds of what the one guys made up in the Bronx. Uh, so it's very interesting. Things really do suffer here. Um, a couple of other things before we get into the decline. You want me to go for like 20 minutes, half hour? Yes. Okay. Um, during the 1970s, and this is the, the slide that I don't have, the incarceration rate started to go up. So if you can imagine, and we back this up, take it back to the previous slide. You can imagine a line that starts right here and goes up a little bit like this and then shoots, starting right in here. Just shoots up straight and doesn't level off till roughly, two, till roughly 2000 doesn't level off till the crime rates went way down already. And it's still actually pretty flat. Um, a lot of things happened. One, a lot of things were going on simultaneously. We also looked at, and these are, by the way, just the spatial layout of those homicide trajectories. You can see the red neighborhoods of the, the, that 19 neighborhoods. You can see they're concentrated up in the top, and they're concentrated in a group of neighborhoods in Brooklyn and also Upper Manhattan. Um, here's what the incarceration data looks like. Now, Beverly talked about a plague, I guess, and this is one of these plagues. Now, certainly, incarceration follows crime to some degree, and you would expect incarcerations to be proportionate for, to crime. If the crime rate was, was at five, in one neighborhood and 10 in the other, you'd expect the incarceration rate in those two neighborhoods to be rough, follow that proportionality, five and 10. That wasn't the case. So it would be five in one neighborhood, the crime rate would be five and 10, but the incarceration rate would be five and 20. That's what Harlem was like, and that's what all of Brooklyn was like. So these are hard to read, it looks much better in a book, but here's what it basically says. The, the neighborhoods with the crosshatch you can sort of see, we couldn't get the colors right because we had a big argument with the publisher about the book. He wanted grayscale, we couldn't do grayscale quite the way he wanted. Um, the same neighborhoods that had the highest homicide rates in 1985 and 1990, when things peaked, had the highest incarceration rates. You can see the gray crosshatching. You would have expected this to, to decline by 1990, by, sorry, by two, this is 96 long after the crime rates had started to go down, about four years into the crime decline. But it didn't, it remained exactly the same. And if we drew this map again in 2000, it would look exactly the same as this. There was no backing off of incarceration during this period of time. Harlem, 
as much as any other neighborhood in the city, continued to send more people to incarceration during this period of time than did other places, even though the crime rates, if you go back and look at this, they were still sending people to prison even when the rates looked like this. It should have backed off, it should have been proportionate, and it wasn't. So what was driving the incarceration rates? Well, we did a paper on this. You saw it, I think, in one of the readings. And there basically were two engines. One was drug enforcement. The other was the structure of sentencing laws. Drug enforcement's pretty obvious. Sentencing laws are a little bit less obvious. Sentencing laws basically said if you are convicted on a second felony, having been convicted on a felony before, you are automatically going to prison. This is, a, this is essentially a two strikes law, unlike California's three strikes law. And um, the, if you think, if you compare that period of time and this period of time, the percentage of people who went to prison on the predicate felony law in this period of time was roughly 25% of the new admissions. In this period of time, it was 50% of the new admissions. So the piling up, you can imagine waves piling up on the shore. The piling up of drug offenses in, every, in an individual in a neighborhood basically was driving a big incarceration trend. And that is, by the way, a causal model controlling for indigeneity, using panel designs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We did the statistics right. Um, but why drug enforcement? Why do we, what do we think about drug enforcement? Did it follow the drug epidemics? Well, we actually started to look at data on drug overdose deaths, hospital admissions to, for drug, uh, acute toxicity and drugs, and so on and so forth, the public health part of my background. Um, and it wasn't that. In fact, it turns out, like the data that we compiled for Attorney General Spitzer, um, it turned out to be preference. There's a paper that I didn't give you guys, but it's a paper published in the American Journal of Public Health by a guy named Leonard Sachs, S-A-X-E. It's published about 2000 or so. Um, and he did a study and showed that drug use and drug dealing across neighborhoods and across races was about the same. The difference was that fo non-white folks did their business outdoors in plain view of the cops. And you've heard about MPV arrests? Yeah. Marijuana in plain view? That's what, that's what plain view means. Um, there's a story we could tell about that when we get into a discussion. Um, so, but so, so the fact where the, where the NYPD did its business with respect to drug enforcement. They were making 100,000 drug arrests a year around this period of time, misdemeanor and felony combined. It's a lot of arrests. Um, was in these neighborhoods, neighborhoods of the highest degree. So you can imagine the dynamic in the cycle that was building up. Um, one other thing to realize, and this is from the law school part of it, in the middle of the riots in 1968, the US Supreme Court issued an opinion in a case called Terry v. Ohio. And the Terry case, set the boundaries and the guidelines for when police could stop somebody on the street under what's called reasonable suspicion and frisk them and search them. Um, it was interpreted by legal scholars as being some kind of like neutral doctrinal Supreme Court thing. Officer McFadden in the Terry case was, was a McFadden. He was an Irish cop, long time cop. Terry was an African American guy. Terry was under suspicion from McFadden because he was walking back and forth in front of a jewelry store at five o'clock in the afternoon in Cleveland. And at that period of time, Cleveland had had its share of riots as well. And there weren't many folks hanging around downtown. So McFadden said, hmm, there's only one reason this guy's hanging around here, he's casing the joint. So McFadden goes in and searches him. Turns out that the court threw out the search because McFadden didn't really have any reason to do that. Turns out that 40 years later, 30 years later, the Supreme Court issues a ruling in a case called Wren, Wren v. U.S. where they said actually McFadden could have done that if he had done it in 1996 instead of, 2000, instead of 1968. But the point I raise about Terry is that right in the middle of the riots in 49 American city, 47 American cities, they issue this ruling that basically celebrates the discretion and professional judgment of cops. You can imagine what that means. Cops professional judgment basically means if you're a Bayesian, it means they're priors. It means all of the things that they assume in their priors. You form your priors by knowledge, by experience, 
by cultural belief. So if McFadden believes that there's a higher likelihood of criminality among African Americans, he's going to suspect the African American and search the guy. And this is the reification in the Terry decision. Well, so Terry was off, it was off to the races after that on race, crime, and law. And the Supreme Court cases from Terry, uh, Washington v. Davis about discrimination, McCleskey on race and the death penalty, Wren v. Ohio, Armstrong, you can, you know, if you go to law school, you'll learn all these cases. And every one of these cases basically says rights are reallocated from defendants to the police and to the criminal justice authorities. And every one of those cases involved an African American defendant. Um, so there's a real interesting racialization of the law and the preferences of the police and a much broader cultural shift towards putativeness, which basically drove up those incarceration rates. So that brings us to, and also and you can imagine how these zero tolerance laws work today. Imagine stuff like fighting in school and this and that. Um, and every analysis that I've seen on this suggests that there's a little bit of a racial edge to that. And so neighborhoods like Harlem are hurt more by these policies, or more affected by these policies, and they're often affected adversely. Okay, so brings us up to today. Or let's say it brings us up to the mid-1990s. Um, the crime rates start to go down. What are the explanations for the crime rates going down? One explanation, it, people are more employed. Well, the data actually show that the employment rates really didn't go up very much through the entire 1990s. Another explanation is that the birth rates were declining. Some evidence to that, but they weren't declining all that fast. Actually, the population change was pretty slow. So between 1990 and 2000, the period of the greatest crime decline, if we believe and the homicide data suggests that African Americans were more likely to be homicide victims, African American population in New York City went down by roughly 10%. That's not going to explain the crime rate, crime decline. Um, was it the end of the drug epidemics? Well, it could very well be. But the causal story there is something that is very hard to elaborate. People may be moved off indoors, off the streets. But that only accounts for a portion of the homicides. It doesn't account for all of them. It doesn't account for guys shooting their neighbors when they get into a fight with them. It doesn't account for domestic homicides, which were also declining. So there's something else going on. Was it the gun laws? No, they were completely ineffective. There's 250 million guns in circulation in the US. New York City has its share. So it wasn't had nothing to do with guns. Better emergency room treatment? That would have nothing to do with robberies. The robberies went down too. None of the explanations are satisfying. Was it a cultural shift? Maybe. That, that actually had a little bit of legs. Many of the ethnographers who were working in neighborhoods in New York during that period of time actually did detect a cultural shift. And what you saw in that contagion paper that you have towards the end, the field work that Deanna Wilkinson and I did, actually it turns out that, that there, we were really in the field at the moment of the cultural shift. And kids were talking about leaving their guns home because they were afraid of the cops. Um, was it the cops? Well. Maybe, except crime rates went down in San Diego, in, in, in uh, Houston, in Boston, in a whole number of other cities, exactly the same amount. In fact, San Diego went down more without doing any of the same tactics that the NYPD did. And if you run regression models and you actually take every, let's say you take the 150 largest cities in the US and you look at their crime rates over time, and you control for the size of the city and the unemployment rate, the number of police officers in the city, you introduce all these controls to sort out any differences between the cities. What's left is nothing having to do, there's no difference, in fact, between New York's crime decline and those of the other 150 large cities. This is a paper published in a journal called Criminology by a guy named Rick Rosenfeld. So it wasn't the police. So uh, what was it? Well. I'm going to argue that it was two things. Um, one was contagion. And you saw that story in there. At some point, everybody who got infected, was, everybody who was going to get infected got infected, like a drug epidemic. Everybody who was going to try it, tried it. Nobody knew was trying it. Among the people who tried it, some people kept using it. Some people tried it and put it away. Same thing goes with violence. Everybody who was going to get violent got violent. The next generation coming up behind them just didn't catch the disease because there was a break. 
Now, it's a little deterministic. The sociologist in me says, wait a minute, people aren't robots. They don't automatically react to the disease. There's some human agency involved. So I think it's, there's, you know, there's something to the contagion model, but I think it works wonderfully as a metaphor, but it doesn't work very well as a causal story. But metaphorically, it is good. Um, the second thing that changed was this. And, and I started thinking about this for a few reasons. One is what I call the Aaron Kupchik theory. Now, poor Aaron's not here, and I abuse him regularly with this. Aaron Kupchik was a very nice young man, a PhD student, working for me uh, on a research project in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, Aaron wanted to move from living in sort of pretty bad graduate student housing. Um, he, was got, he was living with his fiance. They were going to get married. He wanted to find a place to live. Uh, working as a graduate research assistant, even at a you know, moder pretty good level, he still couldn't afford New York housing because by 2000, things were getting pretty expensive. Actually, by the late 90s, they had gotten expensive. Um, so Aaron decided he was going to move where he could afford, where he could afford was Harlem. So he wound up living on the other side of Morningside Park. Now, Aaron wasn't the only person, the only white person who moved into Harlem. And all of you know that this has been going on in Harlem. And all of you know there's a renaissance in Harlem. I was up on the 10th floor of one of our law school buildings this afternoon, and I'm looking out and thinking about talking to you guys tonight, and I'm looking at all the housing. And you could see building after building after building that wasn't there years ago, and that's under construction now. It's still going on. And it goes north. It's way, it goes way above 125th Street. It's really going on. And it's going all the way to the east side. So there's a big transformation. But it's not just gentrification. So I'm selling Aaron short. Aaron, by the way, now is teaching criminology at the University of Delaware. He has tenure. He won the Young Scholar Award for the American Society of Criminology. I take full credit, speaking of <laughs> causal stories for Aaron's success. He used my data for his dissertation. His book won a book award with my data. He's very grateful. Um, I raise this because of housing, and I'm going to tell a little bit of a different housing story. In the, 19, in, the mid 19, in the 1980s, New York's mayor was Edward Koch. Edward Koch was a very, I don't know if you probably see Koch on TV, he's on New York One doing political commentary, does a bunch of ads. Um, Ed Koch was uh, a good mayor in some ways and uh, presided over the crime decline from 1980 to 1985. Um, but he was a racist man. He was not a good man. And, uh, you know it, because you and I are old enough to remember this. You guys probably were barely born then. But if you go back and just cruise through the newspapers back then, uh, there was a lot of tension in this city, more than, more than average. And he was the cause of a lot of it. He said some awful things and did some tough things. But he was held to the fire politically because people didn't put up with it. One of the things that Ed Koch did, and as I think of it as his act of contrition, was to develop something called the 10-year plan. The 10-year plan is a remarkably far-sighted document and plan. And the 10-year plan abandoned housing, the kinds of housing in neighborhoods like Harlem, but really more, and, and like the South Bronx and like other places, was taken over by the city under something called in rem, the in rem provisions, uh, rehabilitated by the city using public funds and then made available to poor people. Some formerly homeless, some who basically were living on welfare and public assistance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He basically took abandoned housing and created, he spent five, he planned out five billion dollars, created 250,000 units of housing. That's a ton of housing. So this was Ed's act of contrition. He started the program here. You can see how he ramped up the spending. Dinkins took office in 1990. Uh, you can see the spending was there, but Dinkins didn't have that much money to play with, so he gradually ramped it down. Giuliani took office in 1994, and he did two things. One is he cut the money almost in half. Two is he privatized the whole program. He didn't want to turn it over to public, to, to, to he turned it over to developers, and they did what they wanted with it. Now maybe there's a little bit of a hint of a causal story in there because you can imagine abandoned housing in Harlem no longer being sold off to poor folks by the city 
He took the city out of the game, and instead the developers were now selling the housing, and we're not quite sure who they sold it to and under what terms. So this is a very different program than Mayor Dinkins and Mayor Koch put into place. But 250,000 housing units is a big shot in the arm. It's a big dose of public policy. And I think that there's some aspect of the causal story here. This is where the money was spent. Look familiar? Looks like a homicide map and looks like an incarceration map. Could also be a tuberculosis map. Could be also be a low birth weight map, right? Could be a drug overdose map. Every indicia that we know about of deprivation looks like this, but that's where the money went. So somebody had the brains to spend the money where it needed to be spent, and it's sustained, sustained over time. This is an average over time. Okay, so what happened? Um, well, and we're not quite sure what the leap is from the in-rem housing to this, but we're working on that statistically. These are, we, we took the city in terms of those th homicide trajectories, instead of four, we did it in three uh, for reasons that are statistical reasons that I can explain if somebody wants to go into it. But the green line is the worst neighborhoods. And relative to their starting point at the outset of the crack epidemic, at the bottom of the last trough on crime, they went up a whole lot more than the more well-off neighborhoods. Now, I'm not making a causal claim, not yet. But this is an awful, awfully interesting story about the fact that housing seemed to improve in the worst neighborhoods right at the same time, simultaneously with the decline of homicide in those places. So it's very interesting and very hard to kind of tease out the simultaneity. Now, if we have a minute and you want to see it, I can show you what the actual models look like. We use something called cross lags which is a, a, a statistical method designed to disentangle simultaneity. You have two simultaneous causes, and you lag one off against this one and the other one off against that one, and you do that repeatedly over time. And guess what? Two things happen. The police and the politicians will tell you that, and Giuliani will run for president, making the claim that when things became safer, investment happened and housing happened and everything else. That the crime decline preceded the housing boom and all the other social recovery. Well, in our models, guess what? That ain't true. The cross lags show that homicide did not precede housing, but the housing improvement actually preceded the crime decline. Better our housing, lower crime. We did that for the entire city. We get a weak effect. When you look and you go back to the four neighborhoods, these guys, the effect is strongest and most significant here. And the kicker is, we threw in as a covariate. We have, we have all kinds of covariates to explain away the difference in the neighborhoods. Uh, racial composition of the population, the poverty rate, um, a whole bunch of other things, number of immigrants in the neighborhoods. Immigration is an interesting story, too. Um, and the fourth covariate was enforcement. And our measure of enforcement was the combination of that drug enforcement stuff we talked about and incarceration. We made a, we made a single vector out of that. And incarceration, Giuliani will tell you, that incarceration in the cross lags should have preceded the homicide decline, which should have preceded the housing boom. Uh -uh. It's not significant. That's what's most remarkable. It is not significant. There is no statistical effect from enforcement. So it may or may not have driven down the crime rates. Our analysis suggests that it had mixed effects on crime rates. In some places, it made it worse. In some places, it made it better. It didn't make the housing rates get any better. So the man's running for president. And boy, we're going to put this paper out in probably in May at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So. Uh, it should be fun at the press conference. Um, anyway, let me show you one other thing. I want to I end up by talking about the legacy. So here we are today. Uh, crime is down. There's construction all over Harlem. Uh, there's construction in many neighborhoods. Um, did it? Who's benefiting and who's not benefiting? Well, one thing we know is that there seems to be 
a forced diaspora of African Americans from neighborhoods like Harlem. And they're going out to places like Orange County and Broome County and all these upstate counties, for better or worse. Um, the folks who stay behind, they could get better and they could benefit from this and they might suffer. They could benefit in the sense that they are now living in neighborhoods that are very valuable. These neighborhoods now have social capital. And I mean this in the, in the sociological sense. Um, and social capital means you have better access to jobs, to municipal services, to political power. Your garbage will get picked up better. Your, your streets will get plowed faster. Your schools should get better. Um, uh, healthcare services should be reallocated out here, and so on and so forth. That could happen. Or, in sociology, there's a theory called relative deprivation, which means that it's not so much how poor you are in some absolute metric, but how poor you are compared to the guy next door. And so if the poor folks are staying behind and the folks next door uh, look like Aaron Kupchik and are upwardly mobile and doing pretty good, that's going to aggravate relative deprivation. We're not quite sure how well relative deprivation works. Sociology majors probably know about things like NME, and they probably know about conflict and so on and so forth. So there's a version of the story where things could get worse. Um, but what really concerns me is this. What you're looking at is data from the New York State Department of Corrections, 1997 to 2006. The purple line is total incarcerations. So it, was, it, kinda, it, it peaked up around 70,000. Of that number, of roughly 50, roughly 70% are New York City residents. That's a constant over time. So figure roughly about 50,000 people in the year 2000 from New York City were incarcerated in New York State. And it started to decline gradually. People were getting let out. New people were coming in less slowly. The yellow line, I'm sorry, the green line is actually that New York City number. So you can see that in the year 2000, things peaked at about 44,000 inmates from New York. By 2006, we now have about 32,000, so that's a decline of roughly 12,000. 12,000 over 44,000 is roughly about uh, 28, maybe 30 percent, okay? The yellow line is the incarceration rate of people from upstate counties. And so in 1997, that number was roughly 21,000. In 2000, when it started to go down in the city, that number had jumped up to about 24,000. It's now about 28,000 by 2006. So that number is inching up. Now, this is not a one-to-one -one exchange, but I can tell you this. Um, I work a little bit still with the Attorney General's office, and uh, the Attorney General conducts hearings around the state um, with citizen groups and with law enforcement agencies and so on. Make a long story short, there's a very big racial component to this story. Uh, those inmates from upstate counties are not racially diverse. It is increasingly minority incarcerations. So something's going on upstate. And we heard this from the Department of Corrections. We hear this from the state attorney general who's hearing things from law enforcement. They think that there's drug epidemics and so on and so forth. You can imagine the stories and what the story kind of is like when a rural upstate town all of a sudden transforms and has people in there of color who've never been there before. And the cops have never seen people of color except in some movie. So you can imagine some of this story. This is a bit of a scary story. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say, and uh, reason number 19 why I'm radioactive. Um, we did the Spitzer study on racial profiling and stop and frisk tactics in New York in 1999. We, we counted, they gave us data, we got about 125,000 stops in the year 1998, year before we did the study. Um, and we found disproportionate, we found obviously people being, being stopped more. Our metric was this. Like the incarceration proportions that I said, we said, well, if the black crime rate is five and the white crime rate is four, 
then the stop ratio should be five to four. Should just be right alongside. Well, it wasn't. It was like, you know, it, it was wildly out of proportion. We, we said it was something like three times greater relative for blacks relative to their crime rate compared to whites, something like two and a half times greater for Latinos compared to their crime rates. Um, by 2003, they actually, in 2001, there was a consent decree in a case called Daniels versus the City of New York, which forced the NYPD to stop doing this, and if they did do it, to write it down. So the stop rate went down to about 90,000 in 2003. In 2006, now what was the crime rate between 2003 and 2006? It was flat. Stop rate between 2003 and 2006 went up 500%. That's not my data, that's the NYPD data. The percentage of African Americans stopped by the police during that time rose from 51%, today it's 69%. So something, uh, to use the language of Terry v. Ohio, something is afoot with policing in this city. And it ain't happening where I live, I can tell you that. Although, it's, you know, when I talk police in our neighborhood, pretty, pretty unpleasant characters. But they're not stopping people on the street. It is happening around here, and it's happening all over other poor neighborhoods in the city. So Terry, the language in Terry was something is, when, when, when the police reasonably suspect the crime is afoot, we have to trust their professional judgment. Well, I'm gonna argue from the other side of the mirror that something is afoot with the police and I'm not so sure I trust their professional judgment. Anyway, this is an interesting story and between this and, whoops, and the housing data, uh, I think there's a big beginning of a, a coherent story about what happened to crime in New York. So, I'll leave it up to you guys. Professor Fagan, uh, questions? Go ahead. Okay, you mentioned that, um, I have a couple questions. You talked about sure. setting up office on 125th. Yeah. And interviewing people. Yeah. My first question is, um, drug dealers normally came in and talked about this, and how did that work? We, <laughs> and we, then okay. my second question is, you talked about finding that the so-called crack baby wasn't accurate. Can yeah. you just further expound on that? Sure. Can you say that medically nothing was wrong with these kids? Yeah. We had a team of, of research assistants who were, um, many of them were ex-junkies. Um, there was, was a racially diverse group. There were a couple of white guys, a couple of Latino guys, uh, a couple of black guys, uh, women and men together. Uh, they went into the neighborhoods and they advertised our study. And we paid people $25 for the interviews. Um, High rate dealers would laugh at us because twenty-five dollars didn't make a lot of didn't it wasn't didn't mean a whole lot. But low rate dealers were interested in twenty-five bucks, and especially if they didn't have to travel that far. So we went out into the neighborhoods, um, all over, not just on one twenty-fifth, but pretty much from one fifty-fifth down to one tenth, and from probably uh, on the other side of Park all the way over to Amsterdam, and that was our catchment area. We brought as many people in as we could from that area. So we, we did get people to come in. We, we did have people coming in repeatedly and trying to collect their $25. We had one guy kept coming in in disguises all the time because he wanted the money. And he would turn, he would, you know, he'd flip the money in, in, into, in, into a, a, a vial, into some rock, but, and we knew it. And we tried not, you know, we, interviewers turned these people away as best they could. But, so we understood the liabilities. I'm not so sure the study could have gotten past the IRB today, actually. But anyway, that's how we did it. We did a similar operation in Washington Heights. We set up, uh, we had our catchment area was roughly 155th up to uh, about 181st, just above uh, the Cross Bronx, um, and from east to west. So we captured, a, a, and used the same strategy. We had ethnographers in those neighborhoods. Um, the crack baby thing was fairly simple. Um, everybody predicted that there would be this huge surge of kids who were born in the late 1980s, who would enter public school, where they would be in public eye, really, for the first time, and they would be wild and out of control. Um, they would have all kinds of damage, similar to what people assume about fetal alcohol syndrome, impulsivity, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turns out that that was never the case. It just didn't happen. Um, by no data within the school system was there any evidence that there were crack babies. Um, at least crack babies as anybody had predicted they would act. You know, terrible in school, 
fighting, uh, dropouts, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing had changed. Um, at the same time, um, pediatricians started to do research on this question, and they started to publish articles and said, where are the crack babies? And the guy who was really the cheerleader for the, for the existence of crack babies was a guy named Ira Chasnov, C-H-A-S-N-O-F-F. And Chasnov basically recanted by 2000. He said, mm, I got it wrong. But, you know, it was a little late. He did a lot of damage during that period of time. My favorite story on this was a New York Times story um, in the, the late 1980s. And big headline says, crack destroys maternal instinct. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. What great news. Somebody had actually discovered the maternal instinct. And they figured it was some, you know, some intersection, you know, some, some spot in your brain where that maternal instinct was hanging out. And they had found it, and crack somehow would travel up in there and eat away at that thing. Well, you know, you, that wasn't quite what happened, as we all know. So, yeah. Yeah. It says that actually there's like the, the effect of isolation there, like even though the neighborhood is improving and as the demographics are you know, improving by the numbers, that those populations who are left behind and still poor, like he really paints a picture of an uneven geography yeah. of services where all the commercial and business services, like all the higher class services, are accessible to the new to the new residents, but you know, it's just the lower Right. There's kind of segregation, like a kind of economic segregation. You know, some people go to the bodegas, and some people go to the higher places, higher places. Um, it's a good question. I, I don't actually don't know who else is studying it. Um, I know that. Um, Mindy Fullilove, who is at Public Health, and Bob, Mindy and Bob both have studied this. They, they've, um, but they stu they're studying gentrification now. The last book that they published was called Root Shock, and it was Mindy who was the author, and uh, she talked about the effects of, um, well, in part, the beginnings of this process, um, but she talked about it in terms of the creation of violence. Um, I know that they're studying gentrification now. I don't know where they're going with the project, if it's going to be a book or a couple of papers, but they are really about the only ones I, I know. I'm sure there are others. But they're the only ones I know who are looking at gentrification. Um, there have been lots of studies by housing economists on gentrification. Um, there have been a couple of studies uh, by demographers. There's a, a very interesting um, research program called Moving to Opportunity. Have anybody of you heard about this? Moving to Opportunity was a voucher experiment run by, by HUD during um, the 1990s. And they would randomly select families and give them housing vouchers. They could move anywhere they wanted and use the housing voucher. And it was a, it was a controlled experiment. So people were selected randomly with you know, powerful research design. Um, and the data are pretty interesting because the data show that actually um, the people who do leave, and it kind of confirms this story about the incarceration maybe a little bit. I mean, the, the two stories connect. Um, the kids who leave actually wind up doing worse after they leave. Uh, the people compared to the kids who stay behind. Um, and they do worse in part because they're displaced. They're in neighborhoods that are very different than what they grew up in. Um, cynics think that they actually do worse because they commit more property crimes because there's more stuff to steal when they're moving into better neighborhoods. It doesn't matter if they're moving into a neighborhood that is still predominantly minority, but it's a higher social class, or if they're moving into a neighborhood that's more racially mixed, they still are not doing better. So, you know, it's a mixed bag, I think, between people who stay behind who could be economically segregated and you're being still remaining down, maybe fourth the bottom end of the ladder, versus moving to a strange place where things may not be happening that are great. And just to follow up to that. Yeah. Yeah. 
interview people who work in law enforcement and social services, uh, maybe go to churches, interview people in the churches, um, and see what stories you're hearing about demographic change, crime change, changes in policing tactics. I think it would be a, a fantastic study to do. It sure does. Uh, there, I know there is at least one dissertation that's coming out of those graphs, but he's going to do it quantitatively. The guy at, 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 at Harvard in the JFK school. But for somebody to do this qualitatively would be really a fantastic study. So are you in grad school? Well, here's your dissertation topic, so run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I, you know, but I, I came to New York. I grew up in New York and left and, um, in, in the early 70s, came back in 1989. And um, during that period while I was gone, I actually did a big gang study. And I did a gang study in uh, like five or six neighborhoods. Um, west side of Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, a couple of other places. Um, and when Deanna and I were doing this field research, we, we were kind of tuned in to see if there was kind of an, uh, an incipient gang structure on the ground. Um, so I can tell you my sense is this. Uh, one, there ain't nothing in this city that looks like Los Angeles or Chicago or San Diego. Um, there was at one point historically, when you and I were coming up, there were gangs in Harlem, there were gangs in the Bronx, there were movies about these gangs. You could do a movie called The Wanderers. Another one of the, uh, was The Wanderers? Yes. Uh, about the Ford and Baldies, which was this You're really. Like pre, pre Prehistoric. Pre 70s. <laughs> um, but now, there, and, and I, I, nobody really quite knows where they went. They, they, I think they went a combination of uh, the Young Lords were a very prominent gang in New York, the Lower, Lower East Side, Puerto Rican gang. Geraldo Rivera was a Young Lord, for example. Um, Gangs disappeared to the, as best as anybody can tell. Nobody really knows. It's another great dissertation, which would be whatever happened to the New York gangs. Um, they disappeared because of heroin, because of the Vietnam War, and because they got politically co-opted. The Young Lords became a prominent political power in New York City. They were just straight out co-opted by the Lindsay administration in the late 60s and early 70s. I don't know if that comports with your sense of things. Um, today, there is a, a very strong structure of the Latin kings and then yetas. Um, they are a vertical organization spanning generations, and I think they're more business than anything else. There are kind of little incipient blood and crip groups around the city. Uh, they have never made the kind of intergenerational connections that you see in real serious big gang cities, even places like Chicago, like Milwaukee, which is one of our sites. So along all of which is to say, I don't think it's a big deal. There are drug dealing groups. They don't, they ain't, they, they ain't gangs in the sense that we understand gangs. So I, I personally discount it. I think police have a gang squad. They think it's more serious. I, from everything I know from having been in the field up till about 2000, I don't see it. Yeah. You guys, you guys flip a coin. Uh, two part question. Uh, uh, first part, you mentioned that um, there's a uh, disparity in drug sales in Washington Heights, Harlem, and uh, University Heights and Harlem was at the low end of the net process. Did your research indicate that that, that was in any way a function of the clientele? For example, Absolutely. Heights, the, uh, Bergen County overflow. Okay. You got it. That's yes. The, an the answer is yes. <laughs> if, you think about, you, if you think about Washington Heights, Washington Heights is at the intersection of the Cross Bronx, uh, the Deegan, the Sawmill, uh, the Palisades, coming across the bridge, the Garden State Parkway coming up and across the bridge, so, and, and up the West Side Highway. So you had people, and we knew this, we had, you had white kids from Bensonhurst and, and Bay Ridge coming up, and all these suburban kids coming in. Uh, and so the clientele was, was a little bit local, but almost entirely kids would come in in cars, buy and get out. And in Harlem, it was local homegrown. They just didn't have much more money, they didn't have that much money to spend. And, those white kids weren't about to drive into Harlem in the middle of 1990. Buy, start buying drugs in the street. So anecdotally, um, the, the drug dealers in 108th Street in Amsterdam here, they'll always say to me that um, they get very depressed when Columbia is out of school because 
it, isn't it interesting that even today, after all this boom in the housing market, Manhattan Valley is still a drug market? I'm always astonished by Manhattan Valley. It, it, it endures through high crime, low crime, and it makes you think about place. What is it about that place? Is it where it's situated? Is it the fact that it really is a little bit of a valley? Is it the fact that it's kind of, kind of in between two police precincts and they don't really patrol it that much? Uh, there, it, it, what is it about Manhattan? It, it, for, it, what, no matter what drug is in, is in fashion, no matter who's living there, it's still a drug spot. Yeah, and part two. Yeah. Um, is there any, I'm sure you mentioned this, but is there any sort of explanation based on uh, quality of representation? And your two cases on the site here, really quickly, that you may be familiar with. Uh, one was uh, Ashley O'Donoghue, uh, 23 year old African American kid. First time offender sold drugs to two white kids at Hamilton College. The two white kids were arrested, then they flipped. And uh, Ashley O'Donoghue, 7 to 21 years, is a first time offender to white kids get probation. Yeah. Uh, second situation here is in New York, called a uh, NYU student called the Pop Princess, 18-year-old uh, girl who was dealing uh, ecstasy, heroin, everything possible from her dorm room, was arrested, and her father is a pretty influential guy in New Jersey. Uh, she never spent a night in jail. They actually showed up at the first prison and had her out, and she got a uh, rehab and uh, a suspended sentence, something of the sort, but never did any kind of time. And the commonality there is sort of the quality of representation. And I see this all the time personally where you know, um, black kids get arrested for the same exact offense, but they have such poor representation. The ADA, the automatic response is to take a plea to something, no matter what you do. And so did your research at all um, show any sort of trends with uh, representation being a function and the disparities with regard to uh, arrest with drug use as opposed to uh, we, we did not include it as a variable. We assumed that um, in poor neighborhoods, folks who were arrested weren't going to go out and hire high-priced legal talent. Um, I don't think we needed to include it because what you said is absolutely true. And it would, it, so, so there were, I, I think it's, it's pretty self-evident. Um, Statistically, had we included the quality of the lawyer, whether or not you had a public defender or a private attorney or an 18B lawyer, court appointed, um, I think that would have been so heavily correlated with where you lived and social class that it would have, been, it would have washed out of the models, statistically. So we didn't, we didn't even go there. I can tell you that in a whole other line of research that I do, we do death penalty research, um, and a lot of it. And I can tell you that, for example, in the study we published in 2002 on error rates, uh, reversals, false convictions in capital punishment cases, um, that the, sing the, the single biggest cause of, of a, a, a wrongful conviction in a capital punishment case was ineffective assistance of counsel, meaning a bad lawyer. Um, and these were generally court-appointed lawyers for capital cases uh, who just didn't have the experience and were, were idiots. Um, so, um, yeah, of course. <laughs> You're right. Just try to do only two more questions. All right. Well, she was okay. aced out by him, so. And, um, and I, I also say, and if possible, could we pass around a sign of sheet on this side and on this side? Because I definitely want to get people's names. I got oh. the name. Oh, you've already got All them? Right. And if you guys want to ask me some follow-up questions, my email is JAF45. For those of you who don't get to ask, JAF45 at Columbia. Now, I may not get answered immediately, but I'll answer you. Now, yes? Yeah. Oh, that's a story. I'm glad you brought it up. Go ahead. This is a, a fascinating story, and I don't think we know the end of the story yet. So, um, right, at, you, know, you know, the Giuliani um, Bratton crime control program was essentially had two faces. One face was um, uh, 
very aggressive stop and frisk activity, searching for guns, on, mainly searching for guns. Um, but the other face of it was, as you know, the broken windows model, which essentially we're not going to tolerate any kind of social disorder, um, meaning nobody hanging around on the streets, drinking, fighting, cursing, playing loud music, spitting on the sidewalk, or smoking joints. Um, to cut to the chase, at some point, the crime rate is so low in New York that there's really no crime for these guys to enforce. Um, and so right around the time when crime bottomed out, marijuana arrests started to climb. And so today, there's 40, roughly 45,000 marijuana MPV arrests, misdemeanor marijuana arrests per year in New York City. 45,000. Now, that's your tax money and mine going to process these. These guys all get run through the system. Very rarely do they get summons or DATs, desk appearance tickets. They, get, they run through the system. They'll do a night in jail or several hours, if not a night in jail, and so on. Um, the four boroughs of New York City are the four highest marijuana arrest counties in the United States, the four large boroughs. So basically, to make a long story short, marijuana is the new broken windows. Um, it's hard to imagine that there are that many people hanging out on street corners, smoking joints, and that many cops doing it. So how are they generating? Now, marijuana in plain view arrest means you have to see it or smell it. How do they generate these amount of arrests? So the story goes like this. If you pick up the CCRB report, they have little thumbnail sketches about different cases that come to the attention of the CCRB. Um, do you remember what a dropsy, a dropsy thing is, a dropsy deal? You're not a criminologist. Um, dropsy deal is this. Back in the day, even, before when, I was, even when I was a kid, um, before I was a kid, when there used to be a numbers racket in New York. Cops would try and bust, the vice guys would come after the numbers guys. And the numbers guys would have their pocket stuff with betting slips, but you know, they weren't in plain view. So they would take the, they'd, they'd stop the numbers guy and they'd say, hey, what's going on? And they, all of a sudden they grab him, throw him up against the wall, go through his pockets, pull out the numbers slips, drop them on the ground and go, whoa, are those numbers slips? Do they drop out of your pocket? <laughs> These are dropsy arrests. This is how they used to, keep, this is how they used to, to regulate and bust the, the numbers runners, and so they would get paid off by the mob who were running the numbers game and so on and so forth. Well, what researchers studying this stuff today in New York hear from, mostly from kids, is exactly the same phenomenon. Kids being stopped, turned around, thrown up against the wall, cops go through their pockets, find some dope, thrown on the ground, MPV. That's where the name comes from, marijuana and blame view. That's the story that's going around. I can't, I, you know, I, lacking another plausible explanation for 45,000 marijuana arrests, these are, these, this, is, this was known in the old days as a dropsy arrest. Um, and a friend of mine, Harry Levine, who teaches sociology at, at, uh, at, at uh, Queens College, he's been studying this. He lives over here on 110th Street. And Harry says um, that he goes to a party and runs into George Soros. Um, and George Soros, as you know, is a big anti-drug anti law guy. And uh, Harry starts explaining to George Soros, George is what? How old is George Soros? 70s? Yeah. Early 70s? And, and Harry says, well, this is what, you know, it's what we hear. The kids are telling us the cops are going through their pockets and throwing the marijuana on the ground. And George goes, in his heavy Hungarian accent, that's a dropsy arrest. They did that when I was a kid. So this seems to be what's going on. Um, but basically, you've got, four, you know, 40, at the peak, 40, almost 40,000 cops in New York. Now there's roughly maybe 36, 37,000. Attrition, they're not hiring, the classes are smaller. A lot of people are retiring because the pay is so dreadful. Um, but you still got 36,000 cops and no crime. What are they going to do? And, and they finance this with overtime pay. So if you go down and you read the mayor's management reports year by year and you look at the amount of overtime pay going to the NYPD, it's astronomical. And there's even almost special appropriations coming out of the city council to pay for it. So basically, they're using marijuana enforcement as a deterrent against other crimes. Or they believe it's deterring other crimes. That's the logic about what they're doing. They'll never admit it. They'll say there's a drug problem. They'll say we abhor marijuana use. It's a gateway to harder drugs. If we let marijuana go, there'll be another crack epidemic, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you get the last one. 
the abortion? Yeah, the abortion theory. Oh, I think there's... I, I think he's. I think he. It, it, I think there is a, an effect of abortion. I think he's widely overestimated the size of the effect. So he says, you know, something like 25% of the crime drop is explained by lower birth rates. I, I think 25% is a pretty outrageous estimate. There's very little. There's very. There's very. There's very little public policy. That can produce a swing of that magnitude in any social behavior like crime. So maybe 10%, maybe 12%. It's still sizable. I don't think he's wrong. Um, I just think he's widely overstated the effect. And, and the reason is because you, know, you have these models. And you, you, you take two states, and you compare uh, the birth rates in two states and the abortion rates in two states. And then you, you assume that, that the two are one is causing the other. And you, can, you statistically control for differences between the states and population, demography, whatever, any, whatever control variable you think. Um, he tends to leave out a couple of really important control variables, like, for example, that drug epidemic business. Um, or one of the things that we didn't talk about about that slide with the, with the roller coasters between the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, I don't know if you noticed, there were three lines on there. Uh, one line was flat. It actually was declining steadily over time. That was the non-gun homicides. So all of the increase and all of the decline in homicide was attributable to gun violence, not just violence. So one could argue that what we experienced in the 1990s was a gun homicide epidemic, or gun epidemic, not even a gun, a gun homicide epidemic, not a violence epidemic. Stephen doesn't account for guns, for example. Uh, and you could do it by gun seizures, which is what we did in our contagion paper. We looked at gun seizures as a kind of, you know, evidence of the presence of a gun in a neighborhood and so on. So um, smart guy. I respect Steve. I know Steve. Uh, I think he sort of missed on the covariates. And better covariates would basically just drive down the size of the effect st statistically. OK. All right. Let's all thank Professor Fagan for coming out tonight. My pleasure. Great question. And if I could add one more thing, I think that my, uh, my stepson's theory about why marijuana busts are up for black and Latino young people is uh, because black parents tend to be very conservative. They won't let their kids smoke dope in the apartment. And so they have to sit out in the, uh, on the, um, um, on the steps, right, in, in, the, uh, in the stairwell where they smoke dope. And that's where they get busted by the cops. Whereas white parents, white upper middle class parents, will let the kids smoke dope at home, wherever, right? In the backyard. In the, you, you name it, right, you name it. And so consequently, they don't get busted. That's his theory. But there's also a lot of cops here. And, and so detection rates are higher. There's one other thing about crime that happened during this period of time, which is that um, there's a very interesting statistic that the cops keep about whether an arrest was made um, based on a crime occurring in plain view of the officer, meaning visible to the, not plain view, but visible to the officer versus not visible. And almost all of the decline in crime during the crime decline period was in crimes that were visible to the officer. So all this stuff, these 45,000 arrests and the right. stop and frisk and everything else, basically drove crime indoors. It's interesting. OK, so um, where's my friend who knows cross legs? Is that you? I'll show you the data. You guys, I know want to see this. Come on. I think we've broken the bank here. We've run out of memory. We save it to the desktop. OK. This is just giving me a hard time. <laughs> 
This is a great slide, by the way, y'all. This, this says, uh, this was from March of 2006, talking about the housing boom in Brooklyn. That's a lot of money. Um, and it said, Bed-Stuy has the most sales, the Heights has the steepest prices, which is very interesting because those two variables really act differently. Anyway, um, hold on. Oh, wrong slideshow. My apologies. I do have one with cross-leg models. I'll email it to you. Okay, sorry. It's not here, and I gotta go anyway. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>